Heavenly Father, we approach your throne with confidence, with humility in Jesus Christ by your spirit, Lord. Even though we are mortal beings, you have delivered us into your kingdom by the blood of Christ. We have been transformed into the likeness of Christ as your sons and daughters. Therefore, as we approach your throne, Lord, uh, may your face shine upon us because you are invited to be our king in this Sunday worship and to be the Lord of our heart, to receive all the glory and praise and the worship. May your presence fill this place with your Holy Spirit so that your people can be strengthened, sanctified, comforted, and guided. Just like the song we just sang, our legions, Lord, is all yours. And Lord, we commit our hearts, even though we confess our hearts may be divided, distracted, maybe even be distressed at this point, Lord. We lay down all our burdens at the foot of your throne, Lord. We wanted to come clean to worship you in spirit and in truth. As we do, O Lord, fill our heart with your joy because your joy is our strength. Lord, we pray for brothers and sisters in this congregation. Lord, many of us uh, may be heavily burdened and weary. And Lord, um, as we come to you, give us rest as you promised, Lord. And we take into your likeness because you are humble and gentle in heart. And your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And Lord, we pray for those uh, who uh, may be sick or just uh, um, went through operation and uh, needs your healing, Lord. Uh, May your mighty power of healing to be upon them, uh, help them recover and overcome the, uh, the ailment and overcome the sickness, overcome the discomfort. And Lord, we continue to lift up um, this congregation to you, Lord. Um, Instill the sense of purpose in our lives so that we know that we are born, we we are saved for a bigger purpose than ourselves and give us your vision. As we continue to worship you, O Lord, uh, bless and anoint your servant Juan as he delivered the message. May what what he says and may what we hear are the one, the message that from you, Lord. We need your word. Speak to us, O Lord, we are listening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. morning morning sisters and brothers as always it is a joy it is a pleasure and it is a deep encouragement to see all of you today online now as much as we wish that being in person together was possible for us all continue to make the best and the most out of what we have right now now with that being said Uh, This month, this semester, or should I say this quarter, we are diving into our next book. And this book is 2 Corinthians. If you remember last year, we went through 1 Corinthians. And now we are going into part two of that and going into the second letter that Apostle Paul sent to the Corinthians. Now, this letter is a little bit different emphasis and tone which is good, but nonetheless, it is God's word, and we trust 
that through the Holy Spirit, the Lord will continue to shape us individually and as a church to better uh, represent and obey him. And before we go any further, I will go ahead and read our passage for us today, one time through, and from there, we will continue on. Today's passage is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us to yourself in your Son, Jesus Christ by your Holy Spirit. Lord, it is Sunday. It is traditionally the first day of the week, but uh, in church history, in church tradition, it is uh, traditionally the eighth day, so to speak, God. The day that you have resurrected, the day that you have made new, has showed us the true reality of this world and of creation and of our lives and as your people. Lord, it is during this time, Lord, we ask that you please lead us with all of our burdens, all of our stress, anxieties, concerns, questions, all the voices in our hearts, in our heads now, we surrender unto you in your name, Jesus Christ. And even if we don't have the willpower or the strength to surrender to you, even in this time, we trust that you will continue to lead us. You yourself will provide in the strength that we lack to surrender our concerns to you. And that with these concerns surrendered, we ask you empty us, Lord, that we may be filled with your word, filled with your Holy Spirit today, painting the trajectory for the rest of this week. Lord, it is during this time, continue to just surrender myself unto you. Trust you to speak in and through me, Lord. I surrender this, these brothers and sisters to you as well. That you continue to help them to actively participate, actively listen, actively receive your word today, to not just take it, uh, to not just take it uh, as a hundred percent from my mouth, Lord, but to truly, truly continue to dissect and to wrestle with your truth, God, for the context that we live in and in this time period, Lord. In all these things, Lord, we surrender to you. We trust, we know that you're with us, your Holy Spirit. You're guiding us through your word and you're moving, you're working, even when we don't realize it. It is in this truth and reality we surrender in your son, Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers, on a day like this, it reminds me of a day not too long ago, actually, a couple of years ago. Now, if you, um, I don't know if you were aware of it then, but a couple of years ago, there was this baseball team from Chicago that won the World Series. In 2016, the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. And when they did, a lot of people were questioning and were purporting that the curse of the Chicago Cubs has been broken because probably almost 100 years, Chicago Cubs have finally won the World Series. However, sisters and brothers, when the Chicago Cubs won this World Series, there was an unimaginable celebration in Chicago. The very next day, a day similar to this, thousands upon thousands of people gathered in the streets of Chicago, lining the sidewalks 
And in the middle of the street, there was this massive parade. This massive parade celebrating the victory, celebrating the accomplishment of the Chicago Cubs. That in this parade, you saw so many of these professional baseball players, all of them with their coaches and all of the staff, everyone coming together, being commended by thousands and thousands of strangers. And it is in this as well, sisters and brothers, that I also remember seeing that, wow, so many of these people who have attended this parade don't actually even really know or care about the Cubs, Chicago Cubs. They really just showed up for the party. They just showed up to just kind of just in the moment identify with what they thought would is success, what they thought was a good thing. That, wow, the Chicago Cubs won the World Series in over 100 years. This is a good thing. So a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon, and a lot of people are hooting and hollering, kissing and hugging random strangers just in celebration of this worldly accomplishment. You see, it is an environment like this, sisters and brothers, that we can come to see that in the culture that we live in, we want success, right? We want wealth and prosperity. We want to be honored. We want to be significant in our culture. Now, you may not have been at this specific event. However, I'm sure there are some moments in your own life that you have seen as well, these uh, variations of these celebrations. But you see, it is in these moments, not only does it reveal our, our, the atmosphere of our culture and the values of our culture, but sisters and brothers, it is in these moments that we also see that we are actually not that different than the Corinthians. You see, it is during this time that the Corinthian people in the Bible, the society, the Corinthian city, was very similar to us today, or should I say we are similar to them since they existed first. You see, sisters and brothers, not only in the Corinthian society and culture did they, did they, did they truly care about wealth, did they care about success, did they want to be honored and privileged in their culture. But sisters and brothers, even for you and I, we can also resonate with them as well. Because in this Corinthian culture, they were also a Roman colony, meaning the people, the Romans conquered and controlled this city as well, which included this city having the laws, the politics and the institutions that the Romans would normally have. And it is here, sisters and brothers, as our own country is also built upon the Greek or Roman values and culture as well, Similarly, again, we are similar to the Corinthians. And if me saying this doesn't strike a chord with you immediately, think about this. When was the last time you followed someone on social media or on YouTube, or you listened to a podcast, check the Instagram or the TikTok? When is the last time you, you followed someone? Because you thought that, oh, what, they do, what they're doing is cool. What they're saying is wise. What they're doing, what they're saying is beneficial to my life, will help me and my goals. You see, sisters and brothers, in this environment, we are similar to the Corinthians. However, on top of that, as, we, as I said earlier, 2 Corinthians is the second letter that Apostle Paul wrote. And so this presumes, as we saw last year, that there is a continuing relationship with the Corinthian church and the Apostle Paul, the writer of this letter. You see, many times in the Corinthian and Apostle Paul relationship, it was very turbulent. The Corinthians didn't really like Paul. They thought Paul was kind of a loser. They thought Paul was a joke. Because a lot of times, the Corinthians, and specifically the Corinthian church, they were so used to hearing speakers who were, who were smart. They were so used to hearing the people who talk to be very witty 
They have to be very eloquent. They have to be very, very just so of the spirit of the age. Someone who just has so much, who's just so charismatic, who could just capture your attention and your imagination with a flick of their tongue. You see, the Corinthian church was used to this kind of speaker. But as we saw in 1 Corinthians, and we'll continue to see in 2 Corinthians, that Apostle Paul, he denounced it. Apostle Paul said, I'm not like that, guys. I'm not an eloquent speaker. I'm not going to speak the way you expect me to speak according to the Greco-Roman culture. Okay. Instead, Apostle Paul says, actually, I just say it plainly. I just say Jesus, Jesus in the cross, and that's it. I'm not going to try to dress it up to cater to your specific preferences. So you see, even in this environment, Apostle Paul, he takes a stand, right? He doesn't just cater to the Corinthians and the culture, but instead he says, well, actually, no, that's not what it means to be a Christian. But on top of that, Apostle Paul also didn't flaunt, uh, didn't seek a wealth and financial benefit from his speaking engagements. You see, when Apostle Paul spoke about Jesus, he didn't want any, he didn't want any accolades. He didn't want any, any benefit from the people who heard him, unlike other speakers who, after they spoke, they would right afterwards come say, all right, what are you going to give me now, now that I spoke? Give me this, give me this, give me that. But instead, Apostle Paul says, no, I'm not like that. I'm not going to do that to you, Corinthians. And so it is in this environment, sisters and brothers, that we are engaging in. As we take a step into the Corinthian world once again, we're going to come at it from a different angle, the angle that Apostle Paul, in this case, you can say, 1 Corinthians was Apostle Paul's kind of like, you know, kind of like offense, sort of, where he was calling out the Corinthian church for their sins, and he was correcting them. But 2 Corinthians, you can think of it as Paul's, Apostle Paul's defense, all right? And his defense is going to mainly center around uh, who he is an, as an apostle and why he is a legitimate apostle of Jesus Christ, why he's a legitimate disciple and, and speaker on behalf of Jesus Christ. And it is here today, sisters and brothers, that we find ourselves in this environment, much like the Corinthian environment in the world that we inhabit today in all of our celebrations and parades, it is today that we find ourselves in 2 Corinthians. Now, sisters and brothers, we need to understand this that today I'm going to focus simply just on this couple of, of, of verses here. And these couple of verses, verses 14 through 17, in a sense, are the trajectory for the rest of this book. That in a sense, throughout 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul speaks about suffering, but specifically about suffering for Christ, not just in general suffering, like I get sick, like a non-Christian gets sick. No. Apostle Paul is specifically speaking about suffering for Christ and why that suffering is his defense as a legitimate apostle of Jesus Christ. And I understand that in the world we live in today, especially in Christian circles, we're not comfortable with talking about suffering for Jesus. In other words, persecution. We're not comfortable with talking about that because we live in a society where we really, where we're not persecuted for Christ. And even when we think we are, that is nothing in comparison to what the early church, the early martyrs experienced, or even what other Christians around the world experience today for their faith. And so sisters and brothers, I understand this can be an uncomfortable topic, but that's good, right? We don't always want to speak about comfortable topics, right? That's not the point of gathering together as a church, but as a church, we must engage in uncomfortable topics as well. And suffering for Jesus' namesake is surely one of those uncomfortable topics that 2 Corinthians highly focuses on. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and dive straight into Apostle Paul's uh, main illustration and main, um, you can say, teaching tool to help us understand what is the purpose of 2 Corinthians, but secondly, what is the purpose of his ministry and the implications for us today as well? So come with me in chapter 2, verse 14. But thanks to God.
who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Now, if you're anything like me, when you first come across this passage, you're probably like, what is Apostle Paul talking about? He's using a lot of words that I really don't hear about today, right? Like procession, what is procession, right? Fragrance, what are all these things that Apostle Paul is speaking about? Sisters and brothers, we need to understand that first and foremost, this letter was originally written to the Corinthian church. Therefore, Apostle Paul is going to use language and analogies that first and foremost, the Corinthian church understood. So with that being said, let me go ahead and provide a brief backdrop for us to understand the illustration Apostle Paul here is using. You see, in this sense, when Apostle Paul says procession, okay, this word would have rung a bell in every Corinthian listener because all the Corinthians, they lived under Roman occupation. They would have understood the cultures of the Romans. And in the culture of the Romans, there was this, this in a sense, a parade called the procession. All right. Now, before I get into that, let me ask you this question first. If today, if today, okay, if we, we had a parade today, assuming, let's just say after the coronavirus is over, all right, and we had a parade today, all right, and you could choose the most important people in America today to be a part of that parade, who would you choose, right? Again, if we had a parade today, assuming we're all safe and stuff from the pandemic and whatnot, vaccinated, and if that's the case, who would you choose to be in that parade? To, to show that as of today, they are one of the most important person in America. I'm sure for, for some of us, we might jump to some of the political activists, right? How, how even in the midst of a pandemic, that the political activists are still out in the streets, risking their lives, using their time, their energy to try to change the minds of government, change the minds and the hearts and the, and the desires of our governmental authorities. Or how about the scientists? The scientists who are responsible for creating the vaccines. How about the scientists who are responsible for raising the alarms about the pandemic? Or lastly, maybe even for some of us in this hypothetical parade, we may even choose our tech giants, like those of Apple, Microsoft, or Tesla, anything of that nature, because we truly believe that those companies, those CEOs, are the ones who have truly contributed to our society. You see, sisters and brothers, whoever we would theoretically choose, ask yourself this question. Is this person, are these companies examples of what you aspire to be? In this theoretical parade, whoever you chose, are these people and companies someone you admire and why? Is it someone you aspire to be like or to do something similar to and why? You see, similarly, during this time in the Corinthian days, okay, this procession was a parade as well. However, this procession was not a parade of who contributed the most to our society, but this parade specifically was a military parade. Now, if you know anything about the Roman history, the Roman people, the Romans, they went around and they conquered a lot of people. They conquered a lot of land and territory through their military. And when they succeeded, they had these parades. It was called the procession, okay? And so in this specific case, when Apostle Paul is speaking of a procession, he is talking about the Roman military victory parades, okay? And it is here that the Romans and all their generals and all of their valiant soldiers would walk through the towns, especially a town like Corinthian, because Corinth was a town that was, that was very large, comparable to those at that time, and it was a very busy uh, city because it was also a seaport as well. But it is in one of these cities that the Roman army 
would, would walk in their victory parades, showing who are the warriors, who are the heroes of that battle. And it is in this analogy that the Apostle Paul uses. And it is here in these Roman military victory parades that it would be considered the highest of high honor for any soldier, any military leader, even the Caesar himself to be a part of these parades. This would be considered something most memorable in their lives. But on top of, of the soldiers and on top of the leaders in the military campaign, not only would the leaders be there, but towards the end of the parade, there would be the, the prisoners of war. There would be the people who were conquered that would be in these parades as well. And the point of these, lack of better words, now as they've been conquered, they are slaves. The point of these prisoners of war, the point of these slaves was to truly show how powerful, how honorable are these Roman people, are these Roman soldiers. They're so powerful that they came over to my land, my hometown, my people, and took over. And now we are slaves. And this was the stark political military reality that the Corinthians and people of ancient and eastern days lived in. And this is the exact analogy that Apostle Paul is referring to. Now, for us, it may sound kind of strange, right? Because we're not used to that. But as I said earlier, we still have parades today just for different reasons. But the parades are still there. Nonetheless, Apostle Paul uses this because at the time, the Corinthians would have understood this. It was very common. Everyone knew about these military victory parades. But specifically, Apostle Paul says this about the parades, okay? Specifically, let's look at what he specifically says in verse 14. Thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us. Leads us, okay? In triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. You see here, Apostle Paul doesn't say, he doesn't say, praise be to God who in Caesar leads us in triumphal, triumphal procession. Praise be to God, who in Festus leads us in triumphal procession. No, Apostle Paul does not name a Roman leader. Apostle Paul does not lay, name a Roman general. For the military parade, Apostle Paul doesn't even talk about military leaders. Who does he talk about? Jesus. Think about that. Apostle Paul talks about Jesus. In other words, Apostle Paul, in this real life scenario and parade, he has switched out to the military leader leading the parade and having the highest honor. He has switched that person out and has placed them with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Essentially, what Apostle Paul is saying is Jesus Christ is the one who has won this military campaign. Jesus Christ is the one who is leading this parade of victory. And a couple of weeks ago, it's a couple of weeks past Easter now, but most definitely Apostle Paul was referring to Jesus' death and resurrection, that Jesus is victorious over death Jesus is victorious over sin. Jesus is victorious over us. And it is in this sentence specifically that in the Greek language, the original syntax of, this, of the New Testament, it is here that we see that Apostle Paul is the direct object of the, of the verbs here. In other words, we're saying that Apostle Paul is the one who is being led like a prisoner of war. Again, Apostle Paul is the one being led like a prisoner of war. In this victorious campaign, it is Apostle Paul who is at the end of this parade. And at the front of the parade is Christ, the victorious king. At the end of it is Apostle Paul, the slave of Christ. 
You see, it is here. The Apostle Paul is essentially saying, Jesus has conquered him. And now that Jesus has conquered Paul, Paul is now a slave to Christ unto death. Essentially, what Apostle Paul is saying is that it is in and through his suffering that the victory of Christ is revealed. That the purpose and the plans of Christ is manifested unto our world. Now, it is this illustration that Apostle Paul is, is using to speak to the Corinthians. And as we see here, that the nature of this illustration is not, doesn't sound very positive, right? Especially living in the context that we are in, we don't really like to talk about being conquered or being slaves, right? And yet here, Apostle Paul is saying just that. That the very nature of the, of the analogy here, the very nature of the Roman military parade was that. You have been conquered. You are now a slave. And it is here the Apostle Paul says, I am a slave. I have been conquered by Christ. And that everything I go through, what I suffer, what I experience is to show Jesus more and more. And this is a theme that will continue to develop and mature throughout 2 Corinthians that we will continue to visit over and over again. So this is most definitely important for the Christian life. But secondly, what happens when Apostle Paul is in this victory, in Christ's military victory parade? What happens? He says this, and through us, second half of verse 14, through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. In other words, in the, these Roman parades, not only, not only were these slaves, the conquered people at the end of the parade, but they were also holding these, these you can say like fragrance, like um, kind of material and substance. They're holding these like incense sticks or they're holding some sort of, of object that emitted a smell. And that smell was to truly show you that this is the smell of victory that the slaves themselves are holding, that the slaves, the conquered people themselves are spreading around to everyone else watching. This is the fragrance to which Apostle Paul is speaking about. In other words, Apostle Paul is saying, as Apostle Paul is in this military parade that Jesus has won, he is holding this. This, this smell of victory, this fragrance. And whoever sees him, whoever is close to Apostle Paul, they will smell the victory of Christ. You see, sisters and brothers in our world today as well, we need to ask ourselves and be honest and be serious about this question. What has taken us captive? whose victory parade are we enslaved and have been conquered by? Because in our context today, sisters and brothers, there's so many forces at play that are constantly competing for your attention, for your allegiance, for your life. There's nothing neutral in this world. And it is in, in passages like this, in illustrations like this, that we need to ask ourselves, what has taken us captive? What has taken us captive? I know from where I come from, a large captivity that my, my own background has is the successful refugee, the successful immigrant, right? That where I come from, people boast, they brag about how they're such a successful refugee, such a successful immigrant because they finally achieved the American dream. And their whole life is just structured towards that, the American dream. That their, their whole being, their whole existence is structured towards that. And even for us today, where we are, maybe we're not that different as well. 
that you see wherever we go in this world, sisters and brothers, when people are by you, when people see you, when people interact with you, what do they see? What is the fragrance that you give off? Who do you represent in those interactions in your day-to-day life? Because in this passage, Apostle Paul is talking about Christ, how Jesus is the conqueror, Apostle Paul is the conquered, and that even his very presence and the very smell and aroma of Paul points back to Christ. And I think if we're honest today, brothers and sisters, majority of our lives really don't point back to Christ. Majority of our lives It's about something else. Maybe it's about us. Maybe it's about a different kind of idea that we're about. But definitely, we need to ask ourselves, have we been conquered by Christ or have we been conquered by something else? What is the fragrance of your life? What is the scent? What is the smell of your life? What do we represent every day? Because it is here, Apostle Paul says, for him, it's Christ alone. But on top of that, more specifically, he says this, verse 15, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Okay. We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. You see, when Paul says this, he is saying something very difficult for us to accept. Continue on, continuing on with this Roman victory military parade, okay? It is in these parades, at the end of the parade, how do they finish it? How do they, how do they conclude the parade for the Romans? As stark of a reality as it is, as majority of human history, these Romans finished their parades by killing and sacrificing their slaves, the conquered to their gods. This is what the Romans did. And this is the analogy Apostle Paul uses. This isn't sugarcoating the Bible for you, sisters and brothers. This is what scripture says, based off of when and where it was written. And this is the specific analogy Apostle Paul uses. It's not a pretty one. And yet, he still uses it. In other words, sisters and brothers, after these people, these conquered people, okay, have been taken captives and slaves. They go to their death. And their death represents the victory of that God or gods or of the Romans specifically or of the people. That was the end of their life. That was the the point of their life according to the Romans tradition. But you see here, Apostle Paul takes that, that reality, that victory parade and turns it on its head. And instead, Apostle Paul says, we are the aroma of Christ to God, to those being saved and to those who are perishing. In other words, Apostle Paul is essentially saying this, sisters and brothers. What is your legacy? Two weeks ago, when it was Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, I spoke about, I preached about death. And how Jesus identified with sinful humanity through death. And how Jesus defeated death. And one day he will finally do away with death when he comes back. But sisters and brothers, essentially here, Apostle Paul is saying, what are we not only living for, but what are we going to die for? That in this analogy, staying again, staying true to this analogy, okay, that Apostle Paul is saying, what are you going to be known for at the end of your life? Think about it. On your tombstone, what is going to be engraven on there? Because for Apostle Paul, all that mattered was not that he was a Pharisee, was not that he was Jewish, was not that he was smart, was not that he was the best speaker. All that mattered to Apostle Paul, all that his legacy would even matter, his whole life, the only thing that would matter to Apostle Paul 
is that his death would be a pleasing aroma to God. In other words, Apostle Paul is saying he is a sacrifice. He is Christ's sacrifice to Father God. Saying that this is the life that is given to you, Father God, by Christ to make you known, to show who you are, your power, your glory, to show who you are, God. And I understand we live in a culture where we don't talk about death. And if we're honest, we just live for ourselves. And yet here, Apostle Paul says, no. Dying and living is for Christ, to make God glorified through Christ. That's the whole point of it. And here, Apostle Paul says, when I die, when my life is sacrificed for Christ, this act, okay, it's only going to have two effects, okay? Number one, it's going to do this. Verse 16, to one, a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. Apostle Paul says, when he dies for Christ, everyone around him, okay, people watching, people listening, they're only going to interpret it in two ways. They're going to see Apostle Paul's death because of Jesus, and they're going to be like, oh, that was a waste of a life. This guy was smart. This guy was like, you know, the best Jewish person ever. He could have did a lot of great things. But instead, he chose to die for this supposedly Jewish king. What a waste of a life. In other words, when it says that Paul's going to die and be sacrificed to Christ and, and to other people who see it, it's going to be a death to death. He's essentially saying that Apostle Paul's death, sacrificial death to Christ, is going to be that continuous reminder, that continuous rebuke to the non-believers to the non-believers of their own impending death as well. Not just talking about the physical death, but talking about the eternal, long-term death. There's only two interpretations for this. God divides his hearers into two groups. Sisters and brothers, wake up. This is what scripture says. Pretty straightforward. And secondly, for those who, who pause life is going to be sacrificed for Christ's sake. The suffering, the persecution. Apostle Paul says this. It'll also be life to life. In other words, when Apostle Paul dies, the, the, basically Christ's death on this world, because he's representing Christ, he's living the life that Christ lived, that Paul's life and death will show the believers, okay, that his death and life is a sign for the believer's own eternal life in Christ. All that to say, sisters and brothers, the life that you live right now, the life that I live right now, okay, it's only going to do two things. That when people look at our lives right now, who we have been taken captivated by, who is leading us in our victory parades, is it Jesus or is it someone else? And at the end of our life, sisters and brothers, just like what Apostle Paul is saying here, at the end of the life, your death, who is it going to, who is it going to attract and who is it going to, to really push away? Because here Apostle Paul is saying his death is truly going to be life-giving to the believers. Because the death that he is giving and, and experiencing is all about Christ. And this is important, brothers and sisters. Because we need to understand that when Jesus was on earth, okay, what was Jesus' life on earth like? Was Jesus' life on earth comfortable, plush? Jesus was just like living large. He was just like the king. Like he had no problems in life. No, actually it was the opposite. When Jesus was on earth, sisters and brothers, Jesus had a life of suffering. Jesus had a life of hardship. They called him the man of sorrows for a reason. And it is here that Apostle Paul is saying, this is the life Christians are called to. You see, sisters and brothers, many times in the world we live in, there's suffering all around us, okay? And I don't need to spell it out for you, but this pandemic, suffering, people die. This race issues with Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, with Black Americans, with the immigration crisis at the border, all of these things. 
this suffering is all around us, sisters and brothers. And it is here that not only does Apostle Paul show us that Jesus redeems death, but here Apostle Paul shows us Jesus redeems our suffering. Even the Son of God did not escape suffering, brothers and sisters. That was not why Jesus came. Jesus did not come to end suffering. That's not what he did. Suffering's still here. People still die every day. There's still tragedies every day. But here, Apostle Paul is showing us Jesus came to transform our suffering. Jesus came to give meaning and purpose and an eternal significance for our suffering. That when Jesus comes back, then, when Jesus comes back the second time, then he will finally get rid of suffering, okay? But right now, in 2021, no, Jesus has not gotten rid of suffering. Instead, Jesus has redeemed suffering, specifically suffering for Christ. And this is also attested in 1 Peter, where Peter talks to, to the, the scattered church. Peter says, don't suffer for what is evil, but suffer for what is good. Okay. And it is here we see, sisters and brothers, that essentially Apostle Paul is saying, even suffering has been transformed by Jesus. If you're going to suffer for anything, brothers and sisters, suffer for Christ. Suffer for Jesus' name's sake. Because it is only in that suffering that there is an eternal reward. And this is exactly why Apostle Paul uses this military, Roman military victory parade. Because brothers and sisters, open your eyes. Look around you. There's suffering everywhere. And here Apostle Paul says, brothers and sisters, don't just suffer for yourself. Don't just suffer so you can have a comfortable life. No, no, suffer for Jesus. If you're going to suffer anyways, suffer for something that matters. Suffer for something, or I should say someone who has eternal significance. This is the word of God. This is what Apostle Paul says. This is the reason why he uses this analogy. Sisters and brothers, for us today, we really need to be honest. We don't need to try to deceive ourselves, right? Because at the end of the day, God knows anyways what's going on in your heart, in your, in your mind. But this is God's word calling us, sisters and brothers, just like Apostle Paul, to embrace suffering for Jesus' name's sake, for the purpose of making Jesus known. Okay. This is why Apostle Paul uses this illustration. So for us today, sisters and brothers, I know that we don't live in a country that is necessarily, you know, seeking out Christians and persecuting them and, and making their life miserable. But we do have brothers and sisters who are living that life. We'll continue to pray for them. But at least for us in this country, there are small ways that we can take upon our cross every day as well, to live a life, to suffer, to die for Christ, for his glory, for his name's sake. And it is this, sisters and brothers, as you, as you live, suffer, and die, we need to show Christ. Number one, as you live, okay, as you go to work, as you live with your family, as you go to school, online or in person, whatever you do in this life, Show Christ. When you go to work, don't just work to, to clock in, clock out, to just get a paycheck. Don't just work to, to please someone. Don't just work to make someone else make money. But work for God's glory. The skills, the talents that you have, you have acquired, use it for God's glory. That the skills and talents that we have that the, the different kinds of ministries, the different kinds of things that we can do, it's unimaginable. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. There was this group of people, okay, who used their computer hacking skills, OK, 
right? And they went online and they took down all of these horrible websites. These websites that were degrading and, and destructive to the human personhood. They used their hacking skills to do just that, to take down these horrific websites. Did they do it for God's glory? I don't know. But they truly used their skills for something greater than just making money. They used their skills for something larger than just for themselves. See, sisters and brothers, even when we go to work, as we live through work, the skills that you have, the knowledge that you have, you're going to have to be creative about it and how you can serve God with it. But it's possible. And I'm here, Elder Jeffrey here, if you want to bounce ideas as well. But likewise, even in our families, as you live, and family is probably the one place we suffer the most, right? Family is the people who know us the best. They know all, the, all your buttons to press. They know what annoys you. They know what bothers you. They know what you like, what you don't like. But you see in family, you know why we call our family family? Is it because we chose them? No. The reason why we call our family family is because no matter what we do, we can't get rid of them. No matter how much I don't like my brother or my sister, it doesn't matter. I can't get rid of them. They're still family which means that, that even when I don't like them, I'm going to have conflict. I'm going to suffer, right? I want to argue. I'm going to be bitter. I'm going to have all of these things with my relationship with my siblings. But you see, sisters and brothers, it's exactly in the family context that you can suffer for Christ by forgiving your sisters and brothers, by bearing and carrying the burdens of your biological family members, your, your, your parents as well. That is in those moments, you can show the gospel with your life. And a lot of times that showing the gospel with your life is not going to be easy. You're going to have to have the hard conversations, okay? The awkward conversations. For God's glory, it's worth it. But that is a challenge unto you. The suffering for Jesus is not just about government and violent persecution, but there are small ways to do that as well, especially in our context, all right? And as I said earlier, two weeks ago, Brothers and sisters, if you haven't done this already, I don't know what else to tell you other than to just say this again. Really take time, okay, to ask God through the Holy Spirit to truly convict you of your death. Because what you believe about death and dying affects how you live. And if, and if we are not taking that seriously, it makes sense that even our Christian life is anemic. It makes sense that our Christian life is malnourished. According to the Bible, the Christian life assumes that we have died in Christ. Our Christian life assumes that Jesus has died our death and that we can live in this life free from the slavery to the fear of death. And I would encourage you, go, go back on our EMC3 YouTube channel. Go look at that. Go watch that sermon again from two weeks ago, from Easter Sunday. Because sisters and brothers, in this analogy in 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul is talking about dying. He is talking about death. And yet he says dying and suffering and death has a greater purpose in Christ. And the, the moment we take that seriously, then and only then will our Christian life, okay, become more mature and more fruitful. But the more and more we ignore that, it's not a surprise that many times Christian life feels very bland, okay? And so all that to say, sisters and brothers, of this analogy of, of the Roman military victory parade, right? Let this make a mark upon your heart, upon your mind and your habits today. But as we go through 2 Corinthians, it's not going to be happy, happy, skipping through the field of lilies. But as you go through 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul, okay, which I'm sure many of us have quoted him, but he's going to talk about his ministry. He's going to talk about why suffering and dying for Christ, persecution, is so important to his ministry. And it is exactly that truth, sisters and brothers, that you and I can both, all of us together as a church, be be humbled by and continuously learn and, and mimic as well. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time in your word today in 2 Corinthians. Lord, I know this is very difficult for probably all of us, Lord, to accept suffering for Jesus' name, dying for Jesus' name. A lot of times it's easy to talk about living for Jesus' name, but seldom do we ever talk about dying and suffering for Jesus' name. But Lord, your word clearly shows us in 2 Corinthians that suffering, dying for Jesus, is normal. Your word shows us that you, Jesus, you not only redeemed human death, you have redeemed human suffering. If and only if that is done under the context of your glory, of your name, Jesus, of making you known, God, then our suffering will ever have purpose. Lord, continue to show us, continue to help us to just wrestle with these truths, God, even if we don't like it, even if it makes us uncomfortable, even if we would rather just ignore it, we trust that your Holy Spirit will continue to just seep it in and convict us, Lord, to show us that this Christian life is more than what we currently experience, God. It is in this truth, Lord, I just surrender these sisters and brothers to you. May you continue to just guide them and lead them in this reality, Lord, because truly what we believe about death affects how we live. So may you continue to show us as Christians, Lord, that we are the freest of all people if we, we know for sure and our lives follow suit, if we, do, if we know that you, Jesus, have already taken our death, that we are no longer slaves to, to the fear of death, Lord. It is in this truth and this reality we surrender to you. May you continue to be with sisters and brothers as we continue to work out in it through their lives, their work, their school, their families, Lord, in all contexts that they may be in right now. May you continue to lead them through your Holy Spirit, Lord, more and more specifically on what it means for them to live a life for you, God, not for themselves, but for you in context with your church as well. It is on all of these things we surrender. In your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.